Ch-ch-ch-ch-ch-chima. Chima, chima, chima. Is that Dora the Explorer? Yeah. yeah. Thanks for listening to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Chima, Chima, took a trip to Lima. Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. And this is Sad Rish Outfield. Sad Rish Outfield. I don't know if I can podcast today. I'm too sad. Oh. Well, I'm going to be joy for you and just annoy you until you decide that you're still sad because the sadness was always sad. And you're listening to another episode of the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Uh, today we have, well, we have half of a story for you today. It's not really a whole story. It's part one of a story. It's a long mother in story. So we split it into two. Also, Rish Outfield really likes to have as many episodes with his name on them as possible. <laughs> there was that as well. I just can't win. Because if we had released a three and a quarter hour episode, then people have been like, oh, leave it to Rish to bore the crap out of me with the world's longest podcast episode. But then when I split it in two, trying to look out for you, sir or ma'am, then I'm just being selfish there, too. Yep. That's the way it works. <sighs> okay. So today's story is called Like a Good Neighbor by Rish Outfield. And the uh, very first musical episode, apparently, <laughs> on the show. Yes, the whole thing will be sung a cappella. So get ready for that. We'll go ahead and play the story. Is there any, uh, some, anything we need to tell them before we get started? Well, you already told them that it's only half the story. Okay. So hopefully they'll only be disappointed by the content and not by the uh, the fact that it cuts off half. By the time. lack of ending? Yeah. Okay. Um, but we'll talk a little bit afterward, and then uh, I guess we'll we'll talk. All right. So uh, enjoy the half of a story, and we'll see you on the other side. Like a good neighbor, by Rish Outfield. Lara Deming would never have seen anything, had she not just gotten her own room. Her sister Emma had shared the downstairs bedroom with her, but had made her parents a deal. If she got straight A's in her seventh grade classes, Mom and Tom would empty out Tom's upstairs office, where he never went anymore, and Emma would get her own room. Well, it looked like a miracle, since Emma was dumber than a bag of kittens, but just as cute but she managed to get four A's, an A-, minus, and two B's for the term, and her parents considered that good enough. But Emma changed her mind about moving upstairs, and her little sister got the ex-office. Lara was ten, and wasn't used to sleeping alone in a room. When there was a thunderstorm, or a scary movie had been on, or no rational reason at all, she'd often climb in bed with her sister, but now she had no such option. She had been on her own for going on a week, when she awoke in the middle of the night. Her digital clock said it was one sixteen, opening her eyes and staring at the ceiling. She hadn't had a bad dream. She didn't have to go to the bathroom. But something had awakened her. Her heart was hammering, and she couldn't just go back to sleep. She could have gone down and asked Emma if she could sleep with her, or do the same in Mom and Tom's room, or just sit there alone to try to calm herself down. She chose the third option. She laid there, thinking happy thoughts, and when that didn't work, she sat up in her bed. Her clock and the glow-in-the-dark stars on her walls created a little light, but the most was coming through her window where the street lights cast an orange glow. She had another window in her room, this one looking across at the neighbor's house, where the old woman lived. Mrs. Holcomb surely had a first name, 
but everybody just referred to her as that, or more often, as Old Widow Holcomb. Lara had only interacted with her once or twice, despite having lived at this address for nearly two years. She was a sour-faced old lady who rarely went outside and never, ever came over to the Demings' house, not even to borrow a cup of sugar, or whatever neighbors did. Nobody in the neighborhood was very fond of the widow. The Werners had, apparently, gone over there to be sociable, and had been so offended they never went back and encouraged others not to visit either. Lara didn't know what the big deal was, since Holcomb had apparently only said Mr. Werner was an adult, but they had taken it in a bad way, and he had ended up moving away from the block. Lara swore she heard a noise from outside. She couldn't be sure, but it sounded like, No! Like a grown-up calling out. She sat in silence for a moment, then went to the window. There was no one outside in the yard or sidewalk, and no cars in the street. But then Lara looked over at the big house next door. A light was on in an upstairs room, and Lara saw movement there. It looked like... No, it couldn't be. Lara turned away from the window, standing in darkness for a few seconds. She turned back. There were two people she could see in her neighbor's window. Old Widow Holcomb. She was facing away from her window, but Lara recognized her gray hair and what looked like a man, either naked or in a state of half-undress. Whoa, Lara said, still interested, still watching. She opened the little latches on the window, and though it was hard, pushed the pane up. Cool night air entered the room, along with the sound of crickets and music from a car or television on the next block. Staring intently across the way to the neighbor's window, she spied more movement from within, but nothing she could particularly identify. Lara couldn't let it alone. She knew where her stepdad kept his binoculars in the closet, just outside his office. So she dashed out of her room, down the hall, and flipped on the light there. Before her eyes were fully adjusted to the brightness, she opened the closet, grabbed the binocular case, and had the lights back off again. She went back to her room, removed the binoculars, and in front of the window looked across to the neighbor's house. There was a man on a bed there, and he was indeed naked. As Lara watched, he writhed in what looked like pain and the old woman stood over him, rocking or laughing. Lara wasn't old enough, or experienced enough, to know about intuition, but she sensed somehow that something bad, something terrible, was going on next door. This wasn't normal grown-up sex stuff. This was something else. The old lady was doing something over there, something that she wouldn't want people to know about especially not a snoopy little girl. For a moment, Lara's view was totally blocked by the old woman. When she could see again, there was blood on the man's chest. Old Widow Holcomb had a knife in her hand, one made of polished rock or black metal, and was, yuck, licking the blade. As Lara watched, the woman turned away from the window, did something to herself with the knife, and when she lifted her hand, there was fresh blood on the blade again. She leaned over the man, who writhed and wriggled, though he didn't appear to be tied up, and touched the knife to him someplace outside of view. She had swapped blood with him for some reason. A thrill went through Lara's young body. It wasn't fear, though, exactly and certainly wasn't amusement. She looked back across at her neighbor. Before Lara's eyes, the old woman became younger. Streaks of black blossomed in her gray hair, her bosoms rose, her hips thinned out, her posture improved. An old man now lay on the bed, shriveled, shaking, hairless. Lara again stepped back from the window. She had heard many stories over the past couple of years about her neighbor, and a couple of the kids had used the W word before. 
All that stuff was made up. Even Lara had known that. But there was no denying it now. Old Widow Holcomb was a witch. Lara set the binoculars on her desk. She didn't know what to do, but she had to do something. She could wake her parents, that seemed like the most obvious solution, tell them what was happening, and they could either go next door to check, or simply call the police and... The police? Lara thought aloud. That was something she could do herself. Do it without leaving her name, and she could safely stop whatever was happening over there. Lara pushed all the doubt from her mind and made a decision. She went downstairs, careful of the squeaky steps, and went into the kitchen. She didn't turn on the light, but opened the fridge to give her enough light to see by. She got her mother's cell phone from its charger and dialed 911. She went into the bathroom and closed the door. The operator got on, a calm female voice, and asked what Lara's emergency was. What is the nature of your emergency? Lara didn't know what to say. I, uh, I saw a man. An intruder? The woman said. No, it's... Miss? Lara repeated herself, adding that the sounds woke her up, and she was worried something bad was happening. Is he still there? Lara thought about it. 228 Locust Lane, or 229, the White House with the gate? There was a man. I think he was being... Tortured? Molested? Magicked? Experimented on? Murdered. There was a bit more concern in the grown-up's voice now. You witnessed this? Yes. He... Please hurry. She was raising her voice now. He might still be alive. Miss, I need... Sorry. Lara said and hung up the phone. She didn't know what would happen to her if she stayed on to talk to them, giving her name and information, but she had seen movies where kids were disbelieved, and if she described the old lady getting younger, that would cause them to doubt her story for sure. She started to open the bathroom door, then powered down the phone first. She went back to the kitchen, sticking her mom's phone in the charger once again. She looked around in case she was not alone, and made sure to close the refrigerator door. She entered the living room and glanced through the downstairs window to the house next door, her eyes catching movement. The old woman was out there, opening the trunk of her car. An old sedan, like gangsters drove in boring black-and-white movies. She pulled something long and black out, curtains or bedspreads, and went back into the house. Lara realized that the size had been wrong for anything other than pillowcases or trash bags. She crept quietly back to her room and immediately got the binoculars to look through the window again. Old Widow Holcomb was sitting on the bed, except she didn't seem so old anymore. She was middle-aged at most, maybe close to Lara's mother's age. The naked man on the bed was a practical skeleton, his skin white and drawn. He wasn't moving. Lara didn't know if he was dead, but when the witch leaned over and kissed him on the forehead, he didn't stir at all. Lights distracted the girl, and she turned to see a police cruiser pulling onto her street, its blue and reds flashing. The car stopped at Lara's house, causing her to freeze in place, her heart hammering. They did think it was a prank. And now they would come to the door and wake up her mom and... The patrol car continued on to old Widow Holcomb's house, parking in front of the witch's driveway. Her plan had worked. Two officers got out. One of them, a thin young man, was holding his flashlight and was shining it around the lawn. The bushes there. The other was a rotund man, speaking into his machine, his walkie-talkie on his shoulder. Lara lifted the binoculars again as the two cops opened the gate. The witch was still in her upstairs bedroom, and Lara could see her stiffen, 
then slowly rise from the bureau where she had been primping and admiring herself. She walked to the wall, where something was hung on a nail there, a necklace or a charm. For a second or two, Holcomb just stood there, admiring it. Then she lifted the necklace from where it hung and left the room, turning off the light switch behind her. There was something about that necklace, Lara thought, that made it special, that made her want to hold it, put it on. She found herself tempted to put on her shoes, go downstairs, sneak out, and see if she could somehow get over there and... What? Steal it? Except for candy or Barbie clothes from her cousins, she'd never stolen anything in her life. Really a crazy thought, when there were policemen standing right there, on her neighbor's driveway. The heavy policeman was on the doorstep, either knocking or ringing the doorbell. The thin one shined his flashlight around the house and toward the driveway, where the old lady's car was still parked. The trunk was not closed, but it was only barely open now, and the man seemed not to notice it. The policeman took a step toward it, passed the light behind the car, and turned to go. No, no, come on, notice, Lara breathed, and the officer paused, turning again and stepping back toward the car. He walked up to it, five feet away, three feet, now only inches. He reached his hand toward the trunk when the porch light came on. Lara had opened the window a crack, but now she pulled it all the way up, hoping she'd be able to hear the arrest. Holcomb's door opened, and Lara could hear the bigger policeman say something that included ma'am, report, and location. Mrs. Holcomb's voice was much more audible. She said something that included Not here, no. The thin cop said something that sounded like Just for a moment, and headed for the trunk again. The old woman stepped out onto the porch, wearing a blue nightdress. And to her surprise, the policeman took her word for it, walking back up the driveway to the front of the house again. Lara leaned closer to the window screen, trying to follow the conversation, and saw that old widow Holcomb had that necklace around her neck, the one with the shiny crystal in it that Lara had seen from her room. The girl held her breath so she could hear what they were saying. Of screaming. A person screaming inside the house. And then the witch did an interesting thing. She cupped the necklace in her hand and said, rather loudly, I think it must have been a false alarm. You're right, of course, the second cop said. That's what I was thinking. Do you mind if we check the house? Just to be safe, the first cop asked. We need to check things out, just in But you've already checked things out. Lara heard the witch say. Yes, said the second cop. I didn't see anything out of the ordinary, said the first. I'm sure it was a mistake, the widow suggested. Or a prank. It was probably a prank, the big cop said. Or a mistake, said the other starting to turn from the doorway. We're sorry to have bothered you, ma'am. What was going on? Why were they doing whatever she wanted them to, instead of what cops were supposed to do? Oh, no bother, Holcomb said sweetly. You do fine work. You looked through this house from top to bottom and nothing was amiss. Amiss? asked the young cop. Wrong, said the older one. Nothing was wrong. Holcomb took a step toward the senior cop, fully out on the porch now. You even checked the basement, you eager dear. I uh, just had to be thorough, he stammered. Uh, you understand. Oh, certainly. Lara would have thought she was mishearing this, except that she had seen the widow Holcomb, a bent, gray-haired old woman, become what she was now a tall, fit lady without a strand of grey in her hair. "'Who called in the report?' she heard Holcomb ask. Oh, "'I don't know, ma'am. Uh, we just—' the senior policeman began. The old woman took hold of her necklace then, 
extending the end of it like you would a crucifix to a vampire. Who called it in? She asked again, louder. It was anonymous, the cop said. But the dispatcher said it was a girl, apparently. Old Widow Holcomb thanked them for coming, and saw them on their way. The policeman got in their car, all smiles, and drove back down the road. Lara couldn't believe it. It was as though they were hypnotized. Somehow she knew it was that necklace. It was magical. Well, there was absolutely no wiggle room now, even if there had been before. Lara's neighbor was definitely a witch. She stood at the window there for a few minutes more. The previously old woman looked around, went back into her house, and a moment later, Lara saw the light come back on in that room. The dead man on the bed was now only a skeleton or mummy. The witch took the necklace from around her throat and hung it up on the wall again. She left the room and Lara stared at it, sitting there, close enough through the binoculars to grab and put on herself. Finally, Holcomb came back in the room, holding a large black garbage bag. She put clothing into it, presumably belonging to the dead man. Then she went to the bed and scooped up the remains in her arms. She bent them, folding them like you would a sleeping bag, and inserted them into the garbage, shoving down the mummy's feet where they stuck out the top. She glanced once in Lara's direction, but was only admiring her reflection in the window. The necklace still hung there on the wall. Lara grabbed a flashlight from beside the phone in the kitchen and unlocked her front door, opened it quietly, and crept outside. It wasn't a cold night, but it was cool, and she considered turning back to get some shoes. But she didn't allow herself to go back, in case that necklace disappeared from the wall between now and then. She walked across her yard to the driveway, where the wrought-iron fence between their properties had a small joint in it, one small enough she could squeeze through. This was crazy. She was outside, barefoot, planning to, what, sneak into her neighbor's house and steal her jewelry? It seemed so. She was in Holcomb's yard now, and that would be enough to get her in trouble, even if she hadn't seen her neighbor murder some guy. But she had witnessed that, as well as proof of witchcraft or black magic, and still she went sneaking up to the house, slowly and carefully. This wasn't like her. Lara was timid and reserved. Emma was the bold one, the one brave enough to walk up to strangers and talk to them. But not to walk into strangers' houses in the middle of the night, hoping to steal. Nevertheless, Lara wanted that necklace. She couldn't say why, but here she was, and had not yet turned back. She didn't plan to. She passed the car. It was a big Range Rover, not a sedan, and crossed the driveway. She went to the kitchen door and peeked in its window. There was a light on in the staircase going to the second floor, but the kitchen was dark. She reached for the doorknob, her heart increasing its beat, her brain asking just what she thought she was doing. And then she saw something more inside the house. Something black and amorphous came down the stairs, and Lara's breath caught in her throat. But it was just the old woman, carrying the black trash bags in front of her. Lara contained a yelp and leapt back off the doorstep and into the shadows once more. A moment later, the kitchen door opened, and the witch came out, carrying two full garbage bags before her. Lara considered making a run for it, but she stayed still, hugging the side of the house, and the old woman, young old woman now, did not turn around. Instead, she removed the key fob from her pocket, and the trunk of her big Range Rover popped open again. Holcomb went around to it. As insane as it seemed, 
even to Lara, she took two steps toward the kitchen door. The girl pulled her right arm back, like a baseball pitcher on a mound, and hefted her flashlight up into the air. It came down on the roof, toward the front of the house, and clattered as it rolled down the other side, rattling on one of the window eaves. The woman muttered something and quickly moved in that direction. Lara moved even quicker. She didn't look to see if she was being observed, but she pulled open the kitchen door and disappeared inside. She ran up the stairs, her bare feet making a slapping sound on the wood, but not much else. Upstairs, she first entered a bathroom, then found the room she was looking for, where the poor naked man had met his demise. There was a smell in the room, an unpleasant one. But every trace of the man was gone, including the bedspread he had been lying on. On the wall, not on a nail, but an ornate hook, was the necklace. Up close, it was just a string with a piece of polished rock on it. Not quite black, not quite brown. Even so, she longed to hold it, longed to wear it around her neck, as though it belonged to her, as though it had been made for her. Lara glanced at the window that faced her house, half expecting to see someone watching her from her room. How creepy would that be? But she could only see her own reflection. Her hair was messed up on one side, and her eyes seemed too big in the glass. But that didn't matter now. She scooped the necklace off the hook and went back into the hall. The house was silent. Lara took a few steps, hearing the floor creak beneath her, but there was no other sound from the house. She heard an engine start up outside. The old woman was leaving to dispose of the body, she presumed. With a sigh of relief, the girl continued down the stairs and through the dark kitchen. The house was immaculately clean, like the handful of show homes she'd been to with her mother. But it felt more like an abandoned building or an empty warehouse. It didn't look like it, but it sure felt like a witch's lair. Lara didn't know why she'd come over and done this, now that it was done. She wasn't the type to sneak around at night, especially in a stranger's house. She couldn't explain it, but she'd wanted to know what the necklace did. She'd wanted it for herself. And that feeling was gone now. Her normal fears came crawling back in, alone in that house, where things might be waiting in the dark. And surely her parents would be awake next door, looking for her, maybe also calling the police, half worried and half angry. She'd be in so much trouble. And that was not taking witchcraft into account. If the old woman caught her, she'd know what Lara took, would wonder what she saw, maybe be hungry for the flesh of little kids. Getting yelled at and grounded by Mom and Tom was a small price to pay if she could just make it home undiscovered. There was silence in the house, but Lara thought she heard a thump coming from the front yard, so she tiptoed through the kitchen and peered out the kitchen window. Seeing nothing there, she opened the door and stepped out into the driveway once again. Two steps out of the house, she froze. Old Widow Holcomb was standing in her driveway, staring at her. Lara gasped. Somebody's not where she's supposed to be, the witch said. I... The witch took a step toward her. Neighbor girl, she whispered, as though thinking aloud. Emma, is it? Laura? She muttered. Awfully late at night, don't you think? The woman asked, still approaching her. Her face was pretty and youthful, but her eyes still looked old and sick. The girl's mouth opened to respond, but no sound came out. Thought you could steal from me, did you? I don't... Lara cleared her throat, <clears throat> hoping to come up with some kind of adequate explanation. I heard a noise over here. She looked beyond. The big car was halfway down the drive, 
its lights and engines off. So did I, as a matter of fact. The old woman held up the flashlight the girl had thrown. Lara didn't look at it. Child, I'm going to a... I heard somebody in your front yard, Lara said all at once. So did I, said Holcomb. She flipped on the flashlight, which still worked despite its tumble, and pointed its beam at Lara's face, like a police interrogator in an old movie. Maybe they dropped that, Lara said, the only thing she could think of. Maybe, the witch considered. More likely it was you snooping around. I wasn't snooping. I heard footsteps, shoes on the cement. The witch nodded. Yes, I thought I did too. Your footsteps, I'm sure. But I'm barefoot, she said, and gestured toward her feet. Yes, you are. Who's with you, child? Perhaps that pretty sister of yours? No, I'm out here alone. Yes, you are, the witch agreed. The woman looked away from Lara, her eyes scanning the darkness of her yard and the Demings next door. She appeared to be deep in thought. Lara didn't get why the witch was still talking to her. She should be marching her next door to wake up her parents or calling the police over again. Or something worse. Maybe it was a burglar and you scared him off, Lara suggested, unable to come up with anything else. Yes, that sounds likely, the old woman agreed. And she didn't sound doubtful or sarcastic at all. Then Lara remembered what she was holding in a tight fist at her side, and how the policeman had spoken to the witch like a couple of gullible idiots. I'm fifteen, you know, she said quickly. Small for my age. Yes, you are, said the witch. No doubt not even considering. But I'm really only five and really, really smart. Yes, you are, agreed the witch. There was no hesitation. Everything Lara said, the woman agreed with. That was what had happened to the cops, why they had acted so strangely when they spoke with her before. Lara smiled. I think there was a burglar in your yard. I think you saw him. You know, I did see someone, the old woman realized. Just for a second. What did he look like? He was, um, it was very dark, I... But he was big, right? The witch nodded. Yes, big, muscular. No, no, big as in fat. Yes, overweight, certainly. And bald, Lara said. But with long hair. The witch ran a hand through her own hair, still nodding. Right, long in the back, but bold in front. No, the opposite. Now I remember he was unusual that way. Holcomb looked back toward her front yard, puzzled. Do you think I should call the police? Lara swallowed. Was she really asking her what she should do? But it seemed that the necklace made people want to do whatever the wearer slash holder wanted. Um, no, I don't think so. I... I think you should whistle a happy tune. The witch paused. She seemed to be mulling it over. I can't whistle. Not a happy tune. She shook her head. Mayhaps I should call the police. Report you both. No, not a good idea. Nothing is stolen, right? The old woman seemed about to argue. Then she wilted a little. If you say so, I haven't had a chance to look around yet. Lara concentrated. I'm sure, she said, focusing hard on the widow's eyes. If you check, you'll see nothing is missing. Yes, you're right, Holcomb said. Thank you for coming over. You're welcome, Lara heard herself say. I guess I'll go back to bed now. Yes, I will too, as soon as I'm able. She was still distracted, like Lara's grandpa when he'd forgotten the reason he'd come into the room. Lara glanced toward the trunk of the witch's car and nodded. Well, have a good night. 
Yes, you too, child. Lara crossed back in front of the woman, keeping the necklace at the side she couldn't see. All of a sudden, a bony, cold hand was on her shoulder. Lara's breath was caught in her teeth. The woman was looking down at her, an unsuspicious expression on her face. What were you called again, baby? Laura Deming? You get some rest, Laura Deming. And the witch turned and went back to her kitchen door. Laura went to school the next day, and though she should have been tired from all her nocturnal activity, she was wide awake. She'd taken the necklace with her, putting it in the pocket of her backpack where her pens and pencils were. She was afraid to leave it in her room or anywhere in her house in case the witch came looking for it. She just kept it in her bag, but couldn't stop worrying it was gone, that it had fallen out, or perhaps been stolen by another student like that troublemaker Clive Chittister. Finally, in the middle of social studies, she had to take it out and hold it in her hand, but tried to be secretive about it so Mr. Forco wouldn't see. It didn't work. Lara, do you have something you'd like to share with the rest of the class? The teacher asked. All eyes turned to her, and a couple of the boys snickered. No. She muttered. All right, Mr. Forco said, and went back to describing some principle called manifest density. Lara smiled. The necklace's magic had worked once again, on her teacher. She looked around. Students were listening to Mr. Forco, or doodling, or leafing through their textbooks, or picking their noses. Nobody was watching her, or even cared what she might be holding. She raised her hand. Yes. It's time for recess, Mr. Forco. He blinked at her. The man glanced at the clock on the wall, then back at his notes in front of him. Yes. I must have gotten us off track. Sorry. And he dismissed everyone for afternoon recess. Old Widow Holcomb had a big oak front door, with what looked like cherubs woodworked into it. Their eyes were empty and staring, and it made Lara feel like she was being watched while undressing. She had been on this porch only once or twice in her life, and except for the night before, she had never been inside. But here she was, squelching down her fears and pressing the doorbell button. No sound came from within, but a moment later... The door opened a crack, and a baleful eye peered out at her. Hello. Lara began. I was... The door came open, and the witch stood before her, her lip curled in distaste. Laura Deming. She was in her thirties at the oldest, in some kind of silk blouse and poofy slacks like the women wore in President Kennedy's day. Her hair was long and black, done up almost like a beehive. She was neither pretty nor ugly, but her eyes were hard, cold. You stole my pendant, she declared. There was no room for denial. After all, the girl was wearing it beneath her t-shirt right now. No, I didn't, Lara said anyway. The witch looked away from her. Her teeth gritted together. No, I don't suppose you did. But it disappeared and, well, I think you lost it. Lara said simply. Yes. The witch said. I do hope it turns up. It has great sentimental value. Lara swallowed and said what she came there to say. You're a witch. I, why would... The woman began, stammering. Her shoulders slumped a little. I am, yes. Well, I was wondering... You must have the pendant. Holcomb hissed. I keep losing my train of thought around you. What pendant? It... El Dije de Spindola. A very rare artifact from Spain. Tell me more. I've had it half a century. The witch went on. Less than a dozen were made, and only five or six are still known to exist. 
Doesn't sound familiar. Oh, the witch said, again convinced she was wrong. What is it you want, little girl? I want you to teach me spells. The young old woman's jaw twitched. What? Spells? Magic? Tricks or curses or hexings or whatever you call them? But I... Lara continued. I want you to teach me three or four just simple stuff I can learn and do myself. The witch suddenly seemed very small. I don't... I shouldn't. If you don't... Lara took a little breath. I'll tell the police about the man you killed last night. The witch also inhaled, but sharper. How do you know about that? I saw you. Holcomb tossed her dark head carelessly. Maybe that was considered attractive. A hundred years ago. The police have been here before and done nothing. She glared at the girl. As you found out when you called them yesterday. I didn't call them. Laura lied. Oh, well, someone called them and they didn't find anything. Didn't even come inside. Laura steeled herself and played her card. They will if I tell them to. Old Widow Holcomb licked her pale lips. She knew exactly what the girl was talking about. I was all she managed, then closed her mouth. Will you teach me spells? The woman scowled at the child. Then she shrugged. Three or four, you said? Right. Please? I could, but it's been a long time since I practiced any magic. Lara was having none of it. You did last night. How can you be so sure it was magic? Because you were old and now you aren't. Duh. Lara felt a minor triumph. One of several in the last few hours. What was that spell for? She asked, then added, You want to tell me? It's to prolong my life, said the witch. I'm a bit older than I seem. Of course she was. Wow. Will you teach me that one, too? Holcomb snorted. And turn you back into a fetus? Oh, certainly. Lara narrowed her eyes. Not to cast it on me, just to learn it. The witch shook her head. I want to. Don't misread me. But it requires a blood sacrifice. Are you willing to take the life of another human being? Lara thought about it. She was just a kid. She didn't need a life-expanding spell right away. Okay, she said. Teach me a simple spell. Something fun. Fun? A foreign word, apparently. You know, something cool. The witch thought for a moment, then said, Do you have any weeds in your yard? All the time. The witch told her what she'd need for a simple but entertaining spell. Laura found a few dandelions back there at the edge of the lawn and only picked the ones that hadn't flowered yet. She took them across to the Holcomb house, then let herself in through the kitchen door. Mrs. Holcomb? She called. The cellar door opened. The old woman carried a glass bottle of 7-Up. It looked ancient. Hope you like soda, she said. It's either that or chamomile. Holcomb got something from the bathroom, and a minute later the two were at her kitchen table. The heads of the dandelions were soaking in the 7-Up. The witch told Lara to touch her fingertip to the glass of pop, then to touch each of her eyelids. Then she took a salt shaker and shook out a few grains onto the girl's still wet finger. Touch your eyes with it. With salt? asked the girl, aghast. Your eyelids, simpleton. Lara did so. Now repeat after me. Lekthu tomolaba canisto. Lekthu... Tomolaba, Tomolaba, Canistor. Lara repeated it. Powers of nature, dark and unseen, may I be one with eyes of green. What? Repeat it. 
Lara did. Now, suck the soda off one of those weed blossoms. What? Yuck. It's only carbonated water and sugar. Lara took one of the stems out and put it in her mouth. Suddenly, a wave of cold went over her. She blinked. The young crone held up an old-fashioned hand mirror. Lara looked in it. Her eyes were a sparkling jade green. Cool. The witch smiled. It is, isn't it? Now try. Powers of nature, dark through and through. May I be one with eyes of blue. Lara frowned. My eyes are already blue. Well, aren't you a belle of the ball? Holcomb said, frowning back. All right. Powers of nature, dark as the dead, may I be one with eyes of red. Lara took another of the blossoms and sang the rhyme, became an odd-looking girl with eyes the color of a ripe tomato. Wow, she said, looking at her reflection. Now what color would you like? Let me try, Lara said. Powers of nature, as dark as a nurple, let me be one with eyes of purple. That's not a proper chant, the old woman said. It rhymed, didn't it? Nurple's not a word. You've never had a purple nurple? Lara studied the crone for a moment. No, I guess you haven't. She licked the dandelion blossom anyway, and to the witch's surprise, her eyes became a brilliant violet. Well, I'll be, she said, and Lara thought she was almost impressed with her. How long will I be like this? Lara asked. Forever, whispered the witch. Wow, even cooler, Lara said. The witch made a shooing gesture with her palm. It lasts an hour. It's a spell for novices. What's a novice? Is that like a kid witch? It is, actually. Teach me another one. Something cool like this. Don't you have homework to do, child? I might, but this is better, more important. The witch seemed to consider it. Well, I have another spell that's simple, but we'd have to find the right toadstool. Toadstool? Like a mushroom? Right. Do you know the woods directly below Regency Avenue? Which one is Regency? Is that the street with the snow shack? I don't know what that is, the old woman said. It's the street parallel with this one, only three blocks down. Oh, that's my friend Annalise Street. I know where the woods are. We could go there tomorrow night. Pick some nice specimens and do the spell the next day. Why not tonight? The witch tossed her head dismissively. There will be rain tonight. Lara didn't ask her if she'd watched the weather report or simply knew. All right. What time tomorrow night? Midnight? asked the woman, then smirked. It is the witching hour. I'm not supposed to be out that late. The woman's smile vanished. Didn't stop you last night. Lara thought about it. You do want to teach me these spells, don't you? Of course I do, Holcomb said, like she had any other choice. No tricks, okay? No tricks. All right. I'll be over at midnight. What should I bring? Flashlight, a bucket, or... She thought of something. Never mind. I have a flashlight you can have. From the burglar, you heard. Lara didn't know if she was joking with her, or if she still believed there had been a burglar, but nodded. So just bring a bucket or a pail to collect them in. I will, said the girl. At school, Lara garnered quite a bit of attention for her suddenly green eyes. Her sister Emma had always been the pretty one. The one's adults, and now teen boys, noticed and pointed out. For once, she got to be the center of attention, 
even from Mrs. Chambliss, the librarian. She enjoyed all the glances and compliments. Until that was, Holly Dunlop pointed out that her mother had colored contacts, and they were only twenty dollars or so. According to Holly, only vain and jealous people changed their eye color. So, which one was Lara? Lara went into the bathroom, not furious exactly, but definitely angry. She looked at herself in the mirror over the sink, muttered an incantation, or whatever you called it, and her eyes turned blue again. Ah well, easy come, easy go. Maybe the next spell would make more of a splash. So there's our half of the story, folks. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. What? You actually enjoyed it? I enjoyed it as much as any half of the story I've ever heard. I don't believe you. I'll tell you that much. Real quick, a cast list for today's story. We had Bria Burton in there. What was Bria was playing? All female characters. <laughs> All right. And Rish Outfield was playing... Narrator? And... One Big... of the policemen... Big Big Anklevich was playing the other policeman and the teacher and the bully kid at school. So there you go. There's a cast list. Nice and short. So that's hopefully going to be our uh, trend from here <laughs> the on The story out. itself, not nice and short, but uh, <laughs> there we go. There's a number of things that we can talk about on here, but I thought we might as well get, away, get it out of the way. The origin of this story, and, and I, I feel like this is a rerun. You told me that we cut out the explanation of this in a previous episode, right? Well, you put it into the outtakes that we hide on the website. Okay. Which I believe probably means that 99.9% .9 of the people that listen to that episode have not heard it. Well, see, that makes me wonder if I'm wasting my time compiling outtakes if 99... Did you say 0.9? <laughs> if 99 plus percent of the listeners never hear those... Well, that's only if we hide them from them on the website instead of just playing them at the end of the episode. Oh, but I like had so much do. fun in the old days trying to figure out where you had put the outtakes. I, maybe I'm the only one, but, you know, that's... Yeah, I think Wendy liked it, too. Uh, <laughs> she was the 0.1%. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, we, we didn't leave that in. We cut uh, that out. Although it was not so much an explanation for this story as just an explanation of why I used a certain swear word in my uh, story, even though it made it a little made my character a little unsympathetic for s speaking in such a way. But yeah, it was just because I, I wanted you to hear it because there's something uh, from a story that you told me and in the end, I think the story that you told was uh, incorrect because I don't think the girl had anything to do with... It wasn't like a sister of that girl or the girl that was in question or anything like that. It was just a girl that was acting in a movie that you were an extra for. So this story is completely unrelated and therefore <laughs> totally necessary. See, I kind of want you to tell the story okay? because... Your version of events so differs from mine. <laughs> All right. So uh, years ago now, this is, shoot, I don't know, six years ago at least, something like that. I mean, the, <laughs> the girl in question in the story is an adult now, but I had a co-worker. <laughs> she can't be an adult. I mean, <laughs> come on. Okay, so she's having her senior prom now this year. All right. I had a co-worker who her daughter was... An aspiring child actress. She'd done stuff here and there, but she hadn't really taken off yet. And uh, her mom worked for a living instead <laughs> of uh, being just the uh, child actor parent that you can be once your kid becomes a child actor and makes tons of money. And uh, I was thinking that it would be interesting to get this woman's daughter to do voices for our show. I think it was right around the time that uh, Brian Lincoln asked Veronica Belmont to be on the show and she did it and was all down with it and I just thought, oh man. And also right at that time, this girl managed to score a big role 
in a big movie and the trailer came out and she had the best line in the trailer and all this stuff and, I, and it was just like okay this girl is destined for stardom if we get her as you know a voice in one of our shows it would be totally worth it you know i'm sure we'd get way more traffic for our podcast than we normally do just because of that i even mentioned it to her mom and said oh yeah I do this show and you know we, we ought to get your daughter to do a voice and her mom was like oh yeah she would probably totally love that that would be great and so i told rich about that he got excited and thought, physically okay yeah we're not going to talk about that though that was an unfortunate side effect but yeah he, he he started trying to think okay what story do i have what story do we have on you know the ones that we've accepted from authors that are submitting to us that we could put her on what where could we uh and finally he just decided nah i'm just gonna write a story that she could be the voice for and so here is the story that he wrote uh well sorry here is half of the story that he wrote six years later here is half the yes. story that I wrote. Six years later, now that the girl is an adult and totally would be unable to pull off being this child that uh, is supposed to be the main character of this story, we're well, presenting it. Even when she was 13 or 14, from the chain smoking, she would be <laughs> unable to pull off the audio of it. Yeah, unfortunately, what happened shortly after I mentioned this to Rish is that, yeah, this girl's career kind of took off. Not only had she gotten that role in a big movie, but she also, right after that, got a role in like a Disney Channel sitcom or something, Nickelodeon, I don't know what. So her mom quit. And I guess she went off to be one a of those showbiz, parent. showbiz parents that <laughs> I was just joking about. And yeah, I haven't I haven't seen her in years, sadly. I have seen her on TV, like hosting a thing or two here and there. I guess she's not only a showbiz parent. She does sometimes try and do things of her own. But yeah, she went off and was, uh, you know, being there on set and making sure her daughter was taken care of. Uh, so yeah, the opportunity to have her be uh, the voice was lost. But um, we still had the story, so that was good. It may have languished for a long time, just on a notebook somewhere in the bottom of Rish's closet. But uh, sooner or later, all of those notebooks float to the top. They all float down here. And soon, you'll float too. Yes. Yeah, see, the, once she had disappeared from your life, and it's interesting, you didn't refer to the woman as anything other than a co-worker. I thought you were going to say friend, so I could go, love her. <laughs> but you never did. So that, that joke is forever wasted. Uh, or, or was it a joke? <laughs> but once that woman was out of your life... And by extension, the little girl was out of your life. Yeah, there was no motivation for me to type up that story. I just, yeah, so it sat in that notebook. Um, but, uh, yeah, here it is, 2017. And uh, why not share it with people, you know? Yeah. It was always intended for this show. and uh, you need to live a why not life. That's all right. You, there are a ton of people who will ask you why. But I, can you remember the rest of the quote? You use it in your show every <laughs> every week, I almost said. Every three months, you use it in your show. Yeah, surround, you yourself, surround yourself with why with... not. And yeah, the originally I just recorded the whole thing for Audible, and then I asked Brya Berton. Yeah, you may not be saying that name right. Oh. Uh, I asked her to do the voice. I thought I asked her to do the voice of Lara, but maybe I asked her to do all of the female voices because uh, I was just going to use my recording of Old Lady Holcomb because we've done that before. We've used my voice as a, a witch before. Yeah? And as like a woman called witch? I, I believe it was witch, not witch. witch. Oh, that, 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 that not one. witch. Witch. <laughs> that just still doesn't work in audio, does it? <laughs> uh, but yeah, Bria went ahead and did all the female characters, and so, yeah, I couldn't... Oh, holy cow, guys. Her re her file of just doing the lines one time each was like two hours and four minutes long or something like that. Wait, that can't be, because the story would be like six hours long in that case. Isn't it? 
Oh, well, you got me there. <laughs> anyway, she really went above and beyond. And so, yeah, I replaced all of my lines with hers. And uh, I don't know if you were always intended to be one of the voices or not, but we got you to, to do a few parts. <laughs> yeah, I think you grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and said, Read this! So that, uh, yeah, I actually had a part in it. Because I think you sent me the lines and then, yeah, it just months went by. And every time we got together, instead we would just watch a movie or eat pizza and then go home or something like that. And finally one day we were actually at my house in front of the mics and you forced me to read my lines. Along with my lines from The Brown Depths. All true. It's weird. There weren't two sides of that story at all. <laughs> okay, uh, so I, we can let people go and come back next week or we can talk about one other thing. About Is it a story. spoiler? No. Well, let's talk about that now. Okay. So this, the title of this story originally was called Lara and the Witch, which mm-hmm. sounds like a children's story. And, and I'm, it's, I, I don't consider it a children's story. I know we've had this discussion before. But, like, right now we're in the parking lot of Target rather than the Coles where we usually stay because the police approached us one time at Coles. There was this, you know, like some teenage hoodlums that tried to get into the car one time at Kohl's. And uh, the boogeyman actually showed up one time at Kohl's, which I thought was weird. And I thought, three strikes. Um, let's <laughs> let's go somewhere else. But here at this Target last week, uh, while you were on the toilet, I was looking through the books. And there was a, a book about a uh, seven-year-old girl, six or seven-year-old girl, who has like an abusive dad and her older brother kills the dad and is a a hero because the older brother saved them from the dad and so then they end up going to live with like foster parents or with cousins or aunts or elderly grandparents or something like that and everything is great but as the time passes this girl starts to realize that there's something wrong with her brother that maybe he wasn't a hero maybe he is evil, like, you know, a, a potential serial killer kind of thing. Yet it's got a fudgin seven-year-old girl protagonist. And so I saw that and I was just like, well, this cannot be like a child book or a YA book or middle reader or kid lit or any of these terrible names that people use instead of saying fiction or horror or thriller or mystery. It's got to be for adults. And yet it's got a seven-year-old protagonist because somebody who's in this car right now told me if you're main character is a teenager, then it's YA. He said, you write YA all the time. Any one of those stories that you write where it's set at high school, those are YA and all that. And I always kick and scream and complain about that, about the label on that, which I need to get past, I guess. But anyway, that really surprised me to have, to find this book here at Target with, you know, a child protagonist, but it is clearly an adult book. Yeah, I would have to amend my previous statement. It's not like any time that your uh, protagonist is a young person that it must be YA. But that's basically the only requirement to be YA. I think a certain level of uh, pulled punches or something like that is required also. You know, you, you yeah, the, the serial killer, the, the really disturbing kind of elements heavy sexual you know i i learned a new category the other day and maybe you told me the exact definition of it but it's called new adult new adult fiction and it's just basically ya with sex is basically what it is i was under the impression that new adult i had heard somebody mention that and that that was like the next level above YA, so now your protagonists... Like, oh, they're a newly adult person? Right, like your protagonists are like first year in college. As a... Barely legal yeah, is, I think, what they used go. to call that. <laughs> but yeah, your protagonist would be like first year of college, and now, you know, you it's, uh, the sex stuff is fair game, and the effed up plot twists of serial killers and that kind of stuff. But I know exactly what you're talking about, because I'm in the middle of writing a book. I think I'm in chapter six of it right now, and so far my protagonist is in seventh grade. But before the book is over, he's going to be a middle-aged man. And it's going to, you know, go through all those years to get there. So I don't think that counts. 
even though it seems very much like a child book to begin with, by the time it's done, it's going to be very much the other end. Middle-aged man having a midlife crisis, etc., is uh, not so YA anymore. And so, yeah, it seems like, I guess, there are other things that are allowed. <laughs> I don't know what I, mine would fit into, what category. Well, yeah, I, I, I don't know what to say on that either. I had heard that rule of, you know, depending on the age of your protagonist, is where that book is placed on the shelves. But all of that labeling is basically for where your book is placed on the shelf. Yeah. And I just, I need to get past it. I don't know how. Maybe it's... electroshock therapy is necessary at this point. <laughs> but I just, I really, really dislike the label YA. Anyhow. So originally it was going to be called Lara and the Witch, and I was worried that that sounded like a child's book. Because it's, you know, doesn't that sound like a kid's book to you? Yeah, a little just, bit. Just if agree with me it, and we'll move on. If you called it The Girl and the Witch, you could probably make it a bestseller right now. Because <laughs> all books at Target's hardcover section have girl in the title. Yeah, so I think that's what you ought to do. We're changing the story now. It's no longer called Like a Good Neighbor. It's now called <laughs> The Girl and the Witch. Well, see, now, yeah, you've derailed because the point I was trying to make was how I got to like a good neighbor. Oh, okay. Sorry. It has changed back to like a good neighbor because there's more story to be told of uh, how you got there. No, I, I didn't want Lara and the Witch. And so I came up with Neighborhood Watch, which I think may actually be a better title than like a good neighbor because that's how Lara discovers that her neighbor is a witch by looking out the window and observing and I had a third title after Neighborhood Watch, and right now I can't remember what it was, but for some reason, I just... It, it, not that it's a song title, but Like a Good Neighbor is technically a song. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, I like that. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And I asked Gino, who uh, listened to these files to make sure that there weren't just myriad mistakes because apparently everything I release has myriad mistakes in it. Does that mean anything to you, like a good neighbor? And he's like, well, yeah, but you spelled it without a U. <laughs> no, it, it meant nothing to him. That's a jingle for an, an insurance company in the United States and Canada. And so I don't know if that's cool or not. Maybe Neighborhood Watch would have been a better title. But, well, you know, if you're listening and you want to option it for a movie, feel free to change the title. Yeah, you could even call it The Girl and the Witch if you were going to option it for a movie. Cause... But, yeah, that's that's the other thing that I wanted to talk about. Just briefly, um, I know that you agonize over titles, and I feel like I don't agonize as much as you do. But clearly that's not the case, because half the time I have, well, it used to be called <laughs> Baby Talk. And then it was called Growth of a Sidekick. And then you said, ooh, where is the growth? On, like on his butt or his back? Or, and I'm like, oh, okay. And so then I, you know, I struggled to come up with another title. Um, that is strange to me. The How much effort do you put into the title? You know, we've talked before about how much effort do you put into the cover art? How much effort do you put into, you know... Making the character so he's not just you with longer hair or, you know, you with an accent and all that. But, I mean, how important is the title? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's it's got to be interesting enough that somebody might say, oh, I, oh that's, that's interesting. Uh, usually I'm not very good with titles. And I think I've said this before. Usually I have a title from the beginning or I never get a title. And I just have to put something really shitty on there, like the wrong ingredients. That uh, was one that you really struggled with. Or, yeah, but I, but I couldn't you also wrote it six minutes before the deadline. True. Or that was knowing part of big, the problem. six and a half minutes after the deadline. <laughs> hey, um, when it's my deadline, if anyone's allowed to uh, break it, I had nothing and I couldn't come up with anything for it. I eventually just gave up and assigned something and several of them have been that way the dear santa was it called dear santa well, that's a, one dear problem santa, yes one problem that i have where sometimes i can't even remember the titles of my stories because 
they weren't there as the story was written. That's usually what I'll do is like, if I have the title, then the title is there at the top of the page from the beginning. And if I don't have the title, well, there's just nothing at the top of the page. And I write the whole story hoping that something will stand out to me. And yeah, most of the time, no, it doesn't. It just never comes along. <laughs> As far as the wrong ingredients goes, the title that I gave that story to begin with was just a joke title, which was Doppelganger Style. Oh, no. <laughs> but obviously I knew I couldn't keep that. Okay. So, But, again, how important is the title? If your story had been called Doppelganger Style, would the votes, the ratings that it got from readers, have been any different what, honestly, what do you think? I don't know. It might have been, when it comes down to it, if it weren't such a bad pun on a title, <laughs> then I would say using a word like doppelganger is an interesting thing. Putting that into your story title, that might be hard to get on the cover of a book because it's such a damn long word. But something like that, something that people are going to go, ooh, what's that? And the fact that every book in the entire Target hardcover section has the word girl in the title, really seems counterproductive. Uh, it seems like they're all going to just seem like the same story. Maybe that's what they're going for. They're all just like, hey, Gone Girl was a huge seller. we got to just get on that. And so is the girl with the dragon tattoo. So Girl on the train. Those are three yeah, giant so sellers. If I, can, if I can get on that, then yeah, I'm putting... If somebody looks at that and thinks, hey, sequel, and they buy it then it's totally worth it. I don't know if they're going for some BS like that. But, yeah, it seems really counterproductive. Like, a title should be something that's going to jump out and grab you. But, I don't know, like... It seems like with short stories, people are allowed to give their stories much more kookier titles. You could give it a really long name, like... The Holiday Trip, starring... Captain America and Bucky. That's right. Our guests think. are guest yeah. starring Captain America and Bucky. You know, you could give it a name like that, or you can give it a weirdly esoteric name like Jason Sanford always does with his stories, or some things, you know, and I guess genre you're allowed to do a little more kookier titles too, like Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? I have no mouth and I must scream. <laughs> But did they make a movie called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? No, sir. No, sir. They made a movie, but they sure as hell didn't call it that. So, you know, once you get mainstream enough, you've got to dump all that and just have a name like Blade Runner, which... Dick's other story, we can remember it for you wholesale. Right. Super long title, the movie title, of course. Total Recall, yeah. which... Truthfully, is a better title. I'm sorry. I like Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep more than I like We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, for sure. And I believe, didn't Paycheck also have a much longer title as well? Might have. I, I, I can't. Anyways, I you can get away with that kind of stuff, I guess, in short stories, because usually you're not, you're not putting it on a shelf and expecting somebody to be like, Oh, uh, this sounds interesting. But I don't know. I mean, we've complained about this and we've used this this quote for years and years when I wrote a movie script and I called it The Hunter and the Hunted, showed it to our teacher. And in one second, he looks at it, says, huh, The Hunter and the Hunted. I'd like it a lot better if it was just called The Hunted. He hadn't read a word of the script yet, but already my title was too long, apparently, and it needed to be something else. And, you know, we've complained or I've complained and I and I think you've been forced to agree with me even though you hate to agree with me on this issue because it involves your favorite teacher. But yeah, I mean it's it's kind of a sucky thing that you can't just give it a name that you want. Instead it's gotta be like one word or you know, maybe two words, something really short that often means nothing. I mean it's Yeah, we we complained endlessly about the Disney movies with their titles. You know, John Carter of Mars becoming John Carter, and The Bear and the Bow becoming Brave, and Rapunzel becoming Tangled. 
I'm sure there's nine the others. Snow Queen or whatever becoming frozen. And what was the Tom Cruise movie called? Edge of Tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, which was a terrible title that meant nothing. Becoming and then they, Live, Die, Repeat. Yeah, they changed it to Live, Die, Repeat, which is a better better title for the movie. At least it means something with the movie, but uh, it's not really a good title. But yeah, Edge of Tomorrow is just so bland. It's like Rise of the... I don't know. The Lycans? I was going to say the Lycans, but <laughs> that 15 different movies that had Rise. Rise of the Planet of the Apes, Dark Knight Rises. Rise uh, of Cobra. Rise of Cobra. Wasn't there Rise trans- of Taj. Wasn't there a Rise of something in the Transformers too? It became the it word, like girl, in every title. They had to put Rise into every title. And they don't mean anything when you do that. The Dark Knight Rises. What did that have to do with the movie? How did he rise? He climbed out of the pit. Seriously, that's what it came from? That's what they named the movie after? Well, I, <laughs> he did. Sure. Why didn't they call it The Dark Knight Breaks His Back? Because he did that too. Because <laughs> somebody said you need it to have you had three to have words. Word rise in it. But, um, but see, the if we walked into Target, and it might be amusing to do it, to just show you all the titles... They have girl in them. How many of those books were originally called The Girl Rises? <laughs> Sorry, Rise of the Girl. My guess is not a lot of them. That some marketing department said, you know, we'll was sell eight to 10,000 more copies if you have girl in the title. Our studies show. And I don't know how you argue with that if you're a creative person. You've probably already signed away your soul just to work for this publisher and so you don't get a say if they want to change your title from, from something that you stayed up nights trying to come up with to Rise of the Girl. And the sequel would be Dawn of the Girl because that's the new word. Dawn is in every title now. Rise has been left behind and they've moved on to Dawn. Yes. But yeah, if, if somebody told me we can keep your title and you will we'll make X number of dollars, or you can go with the title that these professionals, whose job it is to come up with a better title than yours, then your money is going to be significantly more. You will make up to 47 cents more on the paperback rights alone. <laughs> I don't know how you argue with that, because you want money. Not everybody is stupid like me. Most people want money. You're supposed to disagree with me at this point but oh you, you think i'm going to disagree that most people want money no i think they do <sighs> i think that is a thing that most people want it makes the world go round it's the root of all evil it money the, it's a gas yeah, it makes the medicine go down um you get your money for nothing and your chicks for free that's right yeah i, I guess if i'm trying to be california rich and say money is important, feel free to go out and buy like a good neighbor so you can find out what happens next. Or even better, buy the audio version so you can hear my line delivery for all those characters and I get up to 47 cents more for each sale. That is uh, definitely something that you should check out. Before taxes. (laughs) (laughs) So, And PayPal fees. Yeah, head over and do that. I guess we'll let you go after a riveting discussion of the importance of titles. <laughs> well, did you have more to say? I, I, I never realized, had anything to say from the beginning, probably, I realized but halfway I blabbed through on anyways. <laughs> that we had had this conversation before. I was going to bring up, well, yeah, go go buy my book if you'd like. And if, if you wouldn't like, listen to the second half uh, when it becomes available soon. Was that it? Yeah, that's it. We'll see you next week, folks. Or next time. Probably more like it. Yeah, well, either or. or, Whichever comes second. (laughs) Uh, I have been Rich Outfield. And I've been Big Anklevich. Oh, and hey, and thank you to Kevin McLeod of the Clan McLeod, the podcaster's friend for the music in today's episode. Yes. Your mountain is waiting, everybody. Get on your way. Why not? The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like. 
but you can't sell or change the file. Take two. Battle beasts, collect everyone of these incredible beasts who battle for fun. Guess what better? Oh, that. Okay, I'll kiss that better. Let me come over and find out. Is that good? Yep. Battle beasts. A particular swear word in my story when it... You bastard. The guy's sitting in the car. He hasn't even gotten out. It is a short bus, though. So I was going to mention a story that I wrote recently, and I could not come up with a title. It was about an evil radio. Okay. And... Should have called it Soundwave. Oh, hey, that's not bad. Too late. Of course, <laughs> the deadline was months ago. I ended up calling it Radio Gaga. And as soon as I hit send, you know, submit for the contest, I was like, oh. Wait, see, wait, unsend. Unsend, unsend. That title so, so blows. Radio but I was Gaga. trying, I, I, I did a search for songs with radio in the title. And Radio Radio by Elvis Costello came up. And I was like, well, okay. And Radio Song by R.E.M. <laughs> came up and I was like well, but it's a radio song fuck you I bet you they won't play this song on the radio came up um, you know and that. I want to say there's a Radio Days I bet you they won't play this bleep song, song. <laughs> it's not because it's bleep or, or too bleep bleep controversial. controversial just that the a too s- long something is too long strong yeah I can't remember anyhow <laughs> and so Radio Gaga came up by Queen, and I was like, "Oh, okay. well, Gaga sounds is is like lunacy. Is, is Gaga is is someone who's great? Well, that's great. All right, type type type. Radio Gaga, submit. Oh no, what have I done? <laughs> I hate that title so much <laughs> that you I just won the contest, so you can no longer take it back. Well, I should have, but I don't think it was a real contest. They just took the stories and ran. But yeah, I'd, for a short story, <laughs> how important is it for me to just rack my mind and try and come up with something? Or do I just let it go and say, hey, you know what? The story is called Radio Gaga. Your story is called The Wrong Ingredients. Let's let it go and write the next <laughs> one. Yeah, you do have to let it go eventually, which uh, is unfortunate. It's too bad that the perfect title can't come. It's like the freaking uh, story of... It's like the guy getting up at the Brian Singer panel and saying, "What does a frog do when it? What does a frog say when it? No, what or, does a frog? What happens what to happens, a frog when it's struck by lightning? It croaks and oh crap! Where were you? And yeah, Brian Singer actually said that. Oh, where were you when we were making the movie? Because apparently he hated that line almost as much as you and I hate that line. <laughs> but when you put it croaks, which is probably what Joss Whedon wrote in the very first draft of the script. It's a good joke. It fits for what's going to happen to Toad in that scene. It's kind of a mean thing to say. It was a perfect line, but yeah, it arrived two years, three years, four years too late. Way too late for them to fix it, unfortunately. And so the crap stays in there and, you know, you get what you get. And you don't throw a fit. You'll get nothing and like it. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) You will get nothing and like it. (laughs) Okay, out take over. <laughs> I think I may have even, I think Starship Sofa. Ooh, you. I don't think you could hear that. Could you?